Hi everyone, welcome to Travel Explore Celebrate Life with Veena World. As always, Neil and Sunila, both of us are sitting here at the Veena World corporate office. We aren't traveling in any part of the world, but we are here. And today we are going to talk about one city or probably the only city that, that is a transcontinental city. It is in Europe, it is in Asia. On one side is Europe, one side is Asia. And a city, and of course you've seen that in the title, we are going to talk about Istanbul. But Istanbul is a city that is also a very prominent city currently with the war going on in Russia. And that is because it has the Bosporus Strait. But Sunila, when we're talking about Istanbul, at least when I was researching about Istanbul, I was all over the place because there's so much that this city has. And we're going to talk a lot about it. But I'll start with just the name. Now, Istanbul was not always the name, right? The name of Istanbul back then in the 7th century was actually Byzantine or Byzantine, and from the, oh sorry, Byzantium. And then from there, the Constantine the Great made sure that he invaded it. It made it his imperial capital because it was a, a, also a port and that was in about 330 CE or something like that. And then from Byzantium, the name changed to New Rome. And from New Rome, that was the initial name, it became Constantinople. And then finally it became Istanbul after a long, long, long time. But did you know that Istanbul, the name, myth also says, has been derived from the word Constantinople. And you might be like, how did that come from Constantinople? Do you know the story? No, not really. <laughs> but I'd love to hear it because so, you know, if you we've remove, been listening to it in history. But then... Uh, yeah. Yeah. You, if you remove the first and the third syllable from Constantinople, okay. so the first syllable, con, oh. and of course, Stan is the second yeah. one. Tin is the third one and Nopal is the fourth one. So if you just take the second and the fourth syllable, it does sound like Istanbul. So that's what the myth says, that it was wow. actually derived from It's like there. Chinese and whispers. You go on saying something and it turns into something else, right? Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. So let's, let's talk about Istanbul today. And mm -hmm. we'll talk a lot about a lot of things. But one image that has always been striking to me is this landmark in the city, which looks mm -hmm. like a mosque. It's, which looks like a place of worship. And often people pronounce it as Hagia Sophia, mm -hmm. but that's not the real pronunciation. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about it and let's start this episode of Travel Explore Celebrate Life discussing one of the most unique and iconic landmarks of Istanbul. Yes, Neil, you've started off with the most recognizable monument of Istanbul. There are many nice things to see in Istanbul, but every time that we see photos, we see images of Istanbul. I mean, it is very iconic and it is the Hagia Sophia Mosque. Um, we also call it as the, of course, it's a proper name. So you can say Hagia Sophia is what many people say, but uh, it is pronounced in Turkish as Hagia Sophia. Uh, it started off being a church, actually. So, you know, like many great monuments in the world, it's not something that was built just once and it stayed like that for eternity. Things were added, things are removed, and that's how most of these monuments stand the test of time. And you see add additions to it as, uh, you know, with, with time. So the same thing happened with, uh, with Hagia Sophia, which actually started off as the Church of the Pope. So like you said, Constantinople and the Roman Empire. And at one point, this was actually the capital of the Roman Empire. So Constantinople was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, the Roman Empire here. Yeah. And uh, keeping in line with that, in around 6th century, the Hagia Sophia was built as the church. Um, after that, say, between, and it was known to be a masterwork of the Byzantine art, which you mentioned. So around 1200s to 1204, 1261, this became the Church of the Pope. Later, it was captured by the Ottoman Empire, and then they added the minarets to it, and it started looking like a mosque. So, you know, take a church, add four minarets, and then very conveniently and nicely, they turned it into a mosque. After that, it was a museum for very long, and then um, it was kind of controversial, but recently, a few years back, the Turkish government changed it back to a mosque. So the status today is that it is a mosque, but it is also a museum along with that. And a really important thing, and you must visit inside. Like whenever you go to Istanbul, I would definitely say that you have to go in and see it because there's some really beautiful mosaic. It's very decorative. And those who've seen, I think, uh, what was that movie? which was shot on the cruise. The Hindi movie was out there. Zoya Kaur's film was... Uh, had, uh, yeah, was yeah, that, that was shot yeah. in that. 
and uh, there is a lot of istanbul that you actually see in the movie so we'll come to that as we go through but uh, yes it's really good and uh, across from there is also the other important monument which is the blue mosque or the sultan ahmed mosque so in, in fact if you go to the you know if you go on the second floor of the hagia sophia mosque you can also see the blue mosque from there so from the windows and it's really stunning nice gardens in front of it uh, very huge so it gives you that whole grand idea of what an icon should be and of course involves a lot of walking so definitely have good shoes anywhere and especially in istanbul because unless you walk you don't really see the city but yes that is the hagia sophia and uh, a church turned mosque turned museum turned mosque again so definitely something that we should see also what i find really interesting about the uh, mosque is that it looks really beautiful in the day but also go back and see it in the night because when it's illuminated it's like a fairy tale place so <laughs> definitely something we should see yeah and then like you rightly mentioned keep good shoes on because it is the largest city in turkey 20% of turkey's population actually is in istanbul and often people think that istanbul is the capital right people think yeah. like how often yeah. people say that sydney is the capital of australia but mm. when canberra yeah. is the real capital yeah. similarly over here people forget that ankara is the capital of turkey and it's not istanbul mm. but one of the unique things of the city is that it is a transcontinental city right so would you say that a lot of the stuff that you see over here has the european influence also and has the ottoman influence also there is a little bit of mixtures of architectural styles and everything everything neil not just in architecture but i think in behavior in culture in food in every aspect i think istanbul is the perfect mix of the whole world for me like um, you know not just i mean there is of course the arabic influence but you also have on the one side you have europe and the one side you have asia i think one of my favorite memories of istanbul which i will never forget uh, you know something that is deeply etched into my mind and my heart is that i, I was in one of the hotels along the bosphorus so bosphorus is the canal that runs through the city and it's very rare that not only a country but a city has two continents and i was sitting in europe and i could see land in front of me and that was asia so you know <laughs> i was having a turkish coffee there in the hotel in the morning and i'm thinking to myself wow i am in europe and looking at asia and this aspect europe and asia together reflects in everything i mean just look at the most important icon we just spoke about it a church and a mosque together right so that right from architecture to food to um, you know just generally the way people are like they are dressed they are very modern so i would say it's like the modern european flair but that warm asian hospitality that you experience everywhere so istanbul for me is really the perfect mix in terms of everything you find a little bit of everything so the food is is not really indian but it has the spices so it is very very tasty but then you have a lot of salads and other stuff also so you you again you can mix up a lot together in istanbul i guess i guess the confluence of cultures is because it has been the capital city of a lot of empires right it was yes. the capital city of the roman empire or the byzantine empire then it was the capital city of the latin empire it was also known as the capital city of the late byzantine empire after the latin empire and finally it was also the capital city of the ottoman empire so it has been a capital city for about 1600 years until the fall of constantinople in about 1453 ce according to my research after mm -hmm. which it became the seat of the ottoman empire in 1517 now you know one fun fact that i read was that the name changed from constantinople to istanbul but people continued calling it constantinople now the istanbul government so that people ensure that the name istanbul sticks like how you know bombay mm -hmm. changed to mumbai and all of that yeah, people yeah, yeah. people still tend to call it bombay sometimes and then that happened yeah. post offices if they got a letter with the address saying this 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 address and constantinople they would not deliver the letter they would <laughs> they made it a rule that if you want to send a letter you have to have istanbul written on it and that's how the name has stuck and now the name has like stuck all through right yeah. but another important point you mentioned over here is that there is a small canal that passes through mm -hmm. istanbul and that is the bosporus which is the only passage from the black sea to the mediterranean via the sea of marmara 
now yeah. i'd like to point out here that this is a very important trade route that goes through istanbul so like the panama canal or the suez canal you would think that turkey benefits a lot from the bosporus uh, strait that is there but unfortunately even if it houses important ports that link europe and asia and it provides this only passage and all of that they don't own anything because international conventions back in the day have guaranteed that the passage from the black sea to the mediterranean or from the mediterranean to the black sea should happen at maybe i think it's free of cost or the least amount of money so erdogan who's the president of turkey and who's been in the news after russia um, mm. invaded ukraine and after which um, you know turkey actually like opposed finland and sweden's application to nato right so erdogan wanted to actually build another canal which is known as the canal project of istanbul so that they can start earning from all of these things so the project is a new strait between the black sea and the marmara sea but it's not happened yet but they say that istanbul may have a new canal in the future but there are many environmental restrictions and all of these that um are there but that that was another unique story that i came across with now should we talk about the food because you mentioned food briefly and yes nee but before yeah. we go there since you mentioned the bosphorus i think we need to talk a little bit more about the bosphorus because okay. it is at the heart of istanbul and definitely one of the best things to do is at the bosphorus the bosphorus also has an inlet um, you know and which is very romantically called i think i i love the name it says it's the golden horn so the golden horn in istanbul and a lot of people will mention golden horn tours they will mention to you that you must visit the golden horn but so it's nothing but an inlet of the bosphorus and when the sun sets like when the sun shines uh, the it, the entire place turns yellow and golden the water there reflects the sunlight and it becomes it looks really golden and that is why it's given the name golden horn so it separates the european side of istanbul from the old city and the new city and that is why it is really important and wherever you go you will keep crossing this in istanbul so you will cross the golden horn at some point or the other and it is really beautiful so one of the most uh, favorite things to do in istanbul and which a lot of people do so whether you are on holiday whether you are on a incentive tour like whether you are on a corporate holiday because incidentally istanbul is also really a favorite with these companies who want to take their employees there and as we talk we'll see why because there's just so much to do here so whether you are on a corporate tour you know or whether you are on holiday whether you are on honeymoon whether you are on whatever for any reason you would want to take a cruise on the bosphorus and one of the best times to do and anyways that is my favorite time for any cruises is during sunset or the twilight hour and it looks really beautiful and the cruise takes you all along the bosphorus it takes you along the european side and then it takes you along the asian side as well so just that feeling that you are you know, in the middle of two continents is i i i wanted to ask you you said best time of course is sunset but yeah. istanbul would be a year round destination don't you think because yes it, definitely yeah. because the winters yes it can get cold but it's not that cold that you can't enjoy and the summers are not that hot that again you can't enjoy so at any time and you mentioned something at the start that you been transiting through istanbul and that really also is a nice way to see it because if you want to spend time in turkey you need at least a week or 10 days you know there's so much to do and see in turkey and so many different cities that probably you can't do justice to it every time but i found istanbul a city that you can keep coming back to it again and again and again so the next time you're using turkish airlines and you know going to europe going to the us or going anywhere else take that halt stay back for at least a day or two and go around istanbul because mm-hmm. there is So you know, someone may wonder that why have I transited so many times mm-hmm. through Istanbul okay. and not been there? But speaking of Turkish Airlines, Turkish Airlines has the most connections, yes, to any part of the world. So I think they have about three hundred points that they touch using their flights. And by the way, they have a new business class. So earlier, the Turkish Airlines had that big seat, which was mm-hmm. a two three two configuration. but now they have a biz- new business class which is pretty good like you know should definitely try it and the i think at istanbul airport if you're flying business class or first class the lounge is incredible so um definitely on the list but let's come back to istanbul now we spoke of the hagia sophia mosque you mm-hmm. we spoke of the blue mosque also now 
of course turkey is known as the land of museums also because there are more than 50 museums but what should we talk about next let's just cover the most important uh, monuments or icons and then we can go ahead to food like you said or yeah, anything else neil but uh, yes we mentioned the hagia sophia we mentioned the blue mosque or the sultan ahmed mosque uh, which has six minarets by the way and it's really a beautiful place and there are a lot of uh, restaurants in and around this area where you can sit down and also enjoy the view of these mas ma these mosques uh then you have the top kapi palace which also symbolizes the power of constantinople uh and it was made during the ottoman empire so that is something you should definitely visit and again like i mentioned earlier make sure you have good shoes because you'll be walking everywhere there is also the dolma bachi palace and that is again a place that you must must visit to see that along with that you could go in uh, and visit the galata tower but that dolmachi palace uh, dolma bachi palace sunila is pretty yeah. big right because when i was <laughs> researching it it told me that one, like i just i just have my notes out here but like it has the world's largest bohemian crystal chandelier in the ceremonial hall It's and stunning. if you were if you are to visit it there are just yeah. chandeliers all over and there are 285 rooms it's what it says 46 halls six baths or hammams that are there yes, six and six Turkish baths yeah, yeah and 68 toilets it is the largest palace in turkey and yeah that is that was actually the yes, administrative yes the facade center. itself is some 600 meters long Yeah. And the entire surface area is more than fifteen thousand square meters. I wonder how they got along from one place to the other in those times. But and you know, an, an, an interesting the story about size. the 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 interesting story about the chandelier is that when the chandelier was there, it was originally assumed or thought that it was Queen Victoria who gifted the chandelier to mm -hmm. the Sultan of Turkey. But then, after a few years, they found a receipt which said that the Sultan actually mm -hmm. paid. Um, uh, in full for it and that was something super unique i thought about dolma bachi palace i mean the sultans really did live in style you know all the sultans oh, yeah. lived there it's it's just simply amazing um yeah so okay coming to you know one of the favorite things to do in turkey again and we mentioned the movie dil dhadakne do and they do show that in the movie for those who seen the movie will remember is the galata tower and you can climb up to the galata tower and from the top you get some amazing views of istanbul so definitely something if you have some time on hand um you should definitely definitely go in and see that really thick walls and it's quite interesting there are the tower also has a museum inside it so you can see that as well but it's supposed to have the best views that you would ever have but i have i have really something interesting here that uh, you know all over instagram and all over the internet you'll see these beautiful photos of istanbul and people enjoying and sitting in some rooftop restaurants rooftop cafes so yes there are many restaurants and cafes and you can google and search all of those which have some amazing views of istanbul so you can definitely go into a cafe but if you want a really nice photograph then there are also some special studios so you can actually rent or pay the studios and they've made this whole setup with the turkish pillows and you know the red and white oh, yeah. lines stripe lines so there is one called tat uh, which uh, actually takes your photos for a fee so it's just made to go and take photographs and all you do is go up to that place you enjoy the view take your photos or they <laughs> have a photographer who can do that for you as well and you have those picture perfect photos of you and istanbul they can even give you traditional clothes like similar to what happens in kashmir rajasthan and other places you can have some traditional dresses as well so if you want to have a really nice photographic memory then head out to one of these studios there's another one called selfie which is also in istanbul so there are some places you can actually visit just to take photos or of course there are some very good restaurants and uh, you know you can go to these restaurants and take your photos as well all along the bosphorus as well there are some really pretty restaurants so if you want to enjoy that bosphorus view go to one of the cafes there and um, also the galata bridge like one of the other monuments worth mentioning is the galata bridge and this bridge neil is quite special you must go up there because you see a lot of fishermen out there and people the you know people actually come to see who's caught what so there are the local fishermen who are standing on the bridge and fishing and you can go and see that what is really interesting is that one level below there is the bridge just has restaurants 
So especially for your evenings, it's a great place to go and enjoy some amazing seafood restaurants, Turkish restaurants, all kinds of restaurants. People, you know, having a guitar in hand, the Turkish music is playing. So it's very lively and very nice. So Galata Bridge is something I would recommend that you must visit. So, you know, I had one more place to talk about before we mm -hmm. get into food. And that was Topkapi Palace. Now, yes. Topkapi Palace is now the most visited museum in the city. Like I mentioned earlier, Turkey has about uh, 50 or more than 50 museums, right? So Topkapi Palace also becomes a unique attraction that people often visit because it served as the main residence of the Ottoman Sultans. Today is a museum. It is run by the Museum Authority of Turkey. And as all palaces in Turkey has hundreds of rooms and chambers, but probably the most important ones are the ones that are really open for you. What are the unique things about this palace? Well, again, it is um, the treasury that you get to see over here. But over here, you'll see many artifacts, miniature swords, armor, like weapons and all of that, which gives you a unique idea about the history and the culture that was followed by the Ottoman families. Later on, it became a point where the sultans decided to move and that's when Topkapi Palace changed uh, from the main residence changed from Topkapi Palace to uh, the other palace that we spoke mm. about but we and as many sites in Turkey this has been termed a UNESCO World Heritage Site site right so that is those are some of the things that I would say Turkey or Istanbul is famous for but you know when if we have to go to talk about the food I think you cannot start by talking just about the food, right? Because we often hear about Turkish coffee. Yes. And Turkish coffee is something mm -hmm. that not many people know how to have it because you end up having, mm -hmm. having, having, and then you have all of these particles at the bottom and you think, oh, I have to have those particles also. At least mm -hmm. I'm dumb enough to think like that. But you should not have those particles is yes. what I read. So what was your experience with Turkish coffee, Sunita? It's quite interesting, Neil, uh, because this is the first coffee you see. See, everywhere else you see coffee that is usually filtered, right? Like you would have coffee that is, uh, um, you know, you put in water and you wait for uh, for it to percolate and you have percolated coffee. Turkish coffee is a little different because it is, it is really boiled and it is prepared in a different way. So the special, um, the vessel that they use, a sesve, um, and they use very finely ground coffee beans and actually they are boiling it on on the gas stove so they put the says on the gas stove they put in the uh, boiling hot water and the ground coffee beans and then they boil it and without filtering the coffee served to you so i think because those coffee grounds stay in that water and it's boiled really well they catch the flavor really well so you let the gr coffee grounds settle a little bit in your cup and they are usually a small cup because it is pretty strong so you really kind of have a very big cup and uh, usually it's without milk, of course. And then they give you a small little Turkish delight by the side. That is the typical way to serve it. The coffee cups itself are also quite interesting and quite nice. So that's a good souvenir to bring back if you are in uh, Turkey. And you have it sip by sip slowly. And you'll see a lot of people in the evening sitting together and having their coffee uh, of all age groups. So different cafes along the roads. You'll see the younger ones too. You'll see the older ones too. And it's it's really quite a strong coffee. So, it, But you know, I've has... still not figured why they don't filter it. Because... So they say it has twice as much as caffeine as a regular cup of coffee. That's how strong Yeah, but those is. greens are just like at the end of that. Yeah, but if you, if you, I mean, the trick is really to leave the, you know, the bottom and then it doesn't bother you. So don't, I guess, yeah, don't, it don't bottom, finish no it. Bottoms yeah, up. Don't bottoms but, up. Uh, yeah. No bottoms like... up. So you just sip the coffee slowly and uh, just savor it and then just leave the bottom a little so that the grounds don't come in. So I, I, I'm not sure how it started, why it was used without filtering. But it adds to that special taste. And, uh, you know, being the enthusiast, coffee enthusiast that I am, I got home the Turkish coffee and I said, we we boil our teas. So how difficult is it is to boil coffee? But it's not the same. I don't you know. know there's you something know an interesting in the story, Sunila? Like, yeah. we were talking about Turkish coffee. But uh -huh. do you know how coffee actually came into India? I, I I knew where it came from, but I don't See, know. I know some coffee seeds were got into Kurg and... Um, yeah so you know the middle east was very okay we yeah. are 
we are soon going to do an, an episode on know coffee. the unknown about how coffee came to india but let me yeah. also tell the yeah. listeners and viewers here uh-huh. so it so happened that there was a person who went to yemen and tried arabic coffee not turkish coffee arabic coffee or just coffee that was there and that like i think his name was baba badan or something or baba budan baba budan yeah and baba budan he he yes. had it and he was like wow this is incredible and that was the time when the middle eastern countries or the arabic countries mm. were not allowing you to take the natural green seeds of coffee outside of those countries so you could only have like you could take refined beans or something like that so he wanted to get them back so what he mm. did was he hid seven of these green seeds in his beard and came back to india and that's where he started planting those seeds and from there i think what chikmagalur right chikmagalur yeah, Chik is Chik coffee, they have a coffee, coffee museum there exactly yeah. the coffee museum too so that is how coffee came into india is what they say and of course yeah. then of course you have the cafe coffee days of the world and all of that but those were the seven seeds that brought coffee culture to india is what they say Hmm. but okay let's come back let's come back to istanbul we spoke about the coffee let's talk about the food where should we start since we started with the coffee meal let's also start let's go the other way around let's go from the desserts on to the food and uh, <clears throat> one of my favorite things to do in istanbul of course is to have an ice cream and <laughs> You know, it's difficult to get that ice right cream. Right, to have an ice cream because the first time I was quite shocked. I went to one of the ice cream carts and I tried to get an ice cream and I thought I'm getting one and I thought I'm getting one. But it's fun to see the the ice cream vendors. They keep playing tricks with you and they keep doing things. And you you know ultimately I said just give me my ice cream and that's when I got one. But it's it's quite entertaining and it's it's a lot of fun. So I still always wonder why do they play so many tricks? But the whole idea was to get attention. um you know get people to come in and see the tricks and enjoy it and make it a really enjoyable experience because i think when you have an ice cream you really do go back to your childhood and that's what the vendor thinks as well and then they break the scoop they they turn it upside down they do all these kind of funny tricks so in fact i've started seeing them in india now as well yeah uh, on the express way i think when i was coming i i saw some of them but of course the original is the original you know them playing the tricks world. them playing tricks is such a big part of that entire experience right yeah. i've been seeing videos where people are trying to outsmart them like mm-hmm. making sure they hold that stick and then <laughs> grab the ice cream and all that but then i think you suffered in that experience like having turkish ice cream is that entire experience of you getting fooled you getting that empty cone in your hand you getting that uh like ice cream on your nose and all of that but like that's the experience and i would really encourage people to play along with it because that's the whole one the having that ice cream anywhere is, is the same thing right they yeah. made an experience out of it and i think kudos to them for yeah. that so i think good any other dessert i have no yes. dessert on my now on of my course, list of course baklava so all all the types of baklava that you could ever dream of the one with the pista in it the natural one so many and these all make for really good uh, you know uh, souvenirs so instead of bringing some souvenirs i think it's nice to bring back some desserts for your family friends and whoever you want to and of course enjoy it there as well and we mentioned turkish delight some time back so lots of flavors in turkish delight and you can keep tasting so by the time you're buying you had so much that you're actually quite full so these are a few there are so many more they use a lot of rose in um, rose petals and they make so many things but these are honestly my favorites that is the baklava the turkish delight and of course the ice cream so have the ice cream there but get the other two back here so those are the desserts and there are many many more but yes these are some things that i would recommend and then you know we can start talking of food now <laughs> because there is just so much about turkish food that uh, i guess let's start amazing. talking of it using the first one that is the kebab right yeah. it's the well sis kebab which is basically meat on a stick lamb or chicken mm. that you'll get and it's cooked perfectly over a grill often it comes in a wrap or which is mm. similar to a shawarma but i just like seeing videos on instagram of them making those kebabs in istanbul because They never been trying right yeah it's huh. it's still on my bucket list and that huh. that kebab has just eluded me in spite of being in istanbul at the airport ten trips and guys at the airport you'll not get great food you have to go into the city and like that was first on my list what come what's on your list we can go 
back and forth. The donor kebab, of course, which again, the rotating kebabs that yes. you see. And, you know, these are lamb. It could be chicken as well. But I think the lamb ones are really more tasty. So that's something that uh, definitely you should try. And and the good part of Turkish food is, you know, it's it's a little bit Lebanese. It's a little bit Greek. It's a little bit like there are similarities with a lot of the Mediterranean cuisine in that sense. So there's always something um, different to try. And one of the things is dolma. So dolma is like the Greek thing where they wrap. Um, meat and uh, tomatoes and rice, onion, like a nice mixture which is wrapped in vine leaves and uh, dried eggplants. Eggplants are a staple, I think, of Turkish food as well. You see it everywhere. And these are wrapped in it and they are either fried or steamed. You can get all kinds. So that's again something I think is quite unique uh, to this whole area. So that one, Neil, I, would, I really on, like trying On, on my list next is something known as simit, which is basically mm. available on every street corner and of course we spoke of kebabs and all but this is just a soft bread covered with sesame seeds and is often eaten plain and you know when you order food at a restaurant you'll probably get that bread you know which is which has a few yeah. of the white it and black sesame, sesame seeds yeah. Yeah. that was next on my list and the other one that i also had was the kofta well, mm. they call it the kofte. kofte. We call yeah. it the kofta. And like you rightly said, there are so many influences in Indian cuisine of Turkish food and in mm. Turkish cuisine of Indian food, right? So kofte comes very close, right? Because generally it is lamb, but now you get veg kofte also. Lamb, onion, parsley. And it is deep fried, but not breaded. So you get that like meaty texture on the outside rather than just a proper, what do you say? Mm fried texture that mm. otherwise you would generally get right and there is also if you like the fried texture then that it is often known as the ikli or isli kofte that is that is there so this was also on my list i still have two items do you have anything else i like something called so one of my favorite vegetarian uh, dishes which was also there's of course a non-vegetarian option available in turkey is is what was traditionally village food and that is goslem and goslem is nothing but pastry sheets so it's like a filo pastry and they put in salted cheese and spinach in between and then they you know they uh, they bake it they fry it so it can be made with minced meat as well with beef or something and it's really thin strips of uh, this pastry and and you know when they cook it like it it's the dark spots that come from the baking and the oil um, and that is called the gauze so gauze means an eye and that's how it gets the name Goslem. So that is something oh. I really like because you can walk around with it and also taste it at different places. So I really like that. And then I'll, I'll leave the food to you. But there is just so much, Neil. Everything hmm. here is amazing. Do you, the do you remember there is, there, is, and... there is the pizza type of thing? Yes. Um, which is like, it's known as the Lamakun and also the Pida. Yeah. So Pida is more like... Um, well, let's start with the Lamakun because it is that crispy bread which is made in a wood-fried oven. So... Often it'll be um, tossed with minced meat, pepper, sauce, parsley, and all of that. And the, when it comes hot out of the oven, it tastes really good. And then there is the pita, which is um, just all of this, but it has cheese on top, which makes it look like the the pizza. But you know, um, okay, go on. You were saying no, something. no, go, go yeah. ahead. No, yeah. so you see, like of course, you see Nusrat, right? The guy, the salt bay. Mm. Then there is there are many other chefs who have also become so theatricality while mm. serving food is also a very important thing about the culture. And that's where the ice cream comes from. That's where the Turkish coffee also, how they are making it comes from. And even when they're serving you the lamakun or the pida or all of these kebabs, the way they cut it when they get it on your table and all of that is also part of the experience. So guys, whenever you're um, visiting Istanbul, make sure you find restaurants that, that, would, that would do that because that experience is something in itself. And of course, there are many Instagram celebrity chefs in the world, but it's not necessary that you have to go over there. Because my friend went to Nusrat and my friend was like, dude, I paid so much for nothing. I could have just gone to a local mm. restaurant and that's better. So expensive doesn't mean it's good. Thousands of followers on Instagram for a chef doesn't mean that that restaurant is going to be something okay. that you're going to really love. These, this was my takeaway from it because otherwise we are generally trying to go to the most famous ones. But Istanbul, multicultural city, 
so many good things like you should I want to end the food part unless you have yeah. something else to say no, but I'm since we started the, the reverse order there's something I think I would recommend you and everyone else to try is the breakfast so for breakfast try the Turkish eggs uh, I'm not sure no I, I'm, shakshuka of course is uh, another one that you can try mm-hmm. I'm not really sure of the pronunciation maybe it's kilbir or silbir I think it's silbir uh, so silbir is Turkish poached eggs and you have poached eggs and they are served on top of that is a, a creamy yogurt. So it's got garlicky yogurt and with olive oil around it and a lot of uh, uh, red pepper flakes. So it's nice and spicy, but at the same time, you have this garlicky yogurt with uh, olive oil and it's really tasty. So that's something you should not miss there. And then along with that, if you're walking down Istiklal Street, which is one of the best places to walk, at the heart of the city near Taksim Square. And uh, it is the pedestrian area. Of course, there's a tram running there, but lots of shops out there then do have the uh, roasted chestnuts or corn. So you get a lot of these street side vendors selling you roasted chestnuts, nuts, corn. And definitely that's something else to do in Istanbul. Wow, that's that's so much that we have actually covered in the last 40 minutes on, on this episode. Any final points you want to add, Sunila, or otherwise I'll take it and end it. Yes, Neil. Just actually, there are so many points, but we'll keep it try. I'm going to yeah, short. I'm going to keep it very uh, short. Yeah. We'll keep it short. But one thing, after all the walking, you're going to be tired. So there's something that you must try in Turkey because you're in Turkey and in, in Istanbul is the Turkish hamam, and um, really definitely try it. If you want to be a little more specific, then you should specify that you want it to be private. Otherwise, it's usually not private. And uh, they would lather you. They soap. So it's really, really nice, good scrub. And it feels amazing. Once you're out, you feel like a baby, you know, really nice and fresh. And it's a mix of uh, a scrub and a massage, I would say. So it involves creating a lot of lather. And after some time, you really don't care. You do, you want to have your steam, your sauna and your hamam. If you do have a, some time on hand, then definitely one of the things you could do is an excursion to the Prince's Island, which is a very pretty and nice island, very close to Istanbul. So that's, again, something that we should definitely go there. And uh, the last point I really had was that there's always something new coming up in Turkey. There's always something new coming up in Istanbul. And in fact, the latest, like as we speak, last month, something that reopened after five years is the Basilica Cistern. So this was closed for five years for restoration and a lot of things. And now they have, it. if you see the images, it's beautifully lit with all these, uh, you know, the Roman columns inside and the water. I remember going and seeing it a few years back, but it was in bad shape and it has 336 columns. So each are nine meters tall and it has two Medusa heads. It's really quite spectacular. So that's something that has just come up and I'm sure they're looking at other things. Istanbul in itself, there is so much to do, but it is also a nice gateway into the other parts of Turkey. So be it Cappadocia, be it Izmir, you know, Ephesus, anywhere you want to go. Istanbul, Pamukkale, it's a good starting point. But by itself also, I think the city deserves more than one visit for sure. Well, I'll end it with just asking you. Mm -hmm. More than one visit, of course. But my first visit, how many days should it be? At least three nights. Because we haven't even spoken of the Grand Bazaar. And a Grand Bazaar, we can do an (laughs) entire episode on Grand Bazaar. It's known as the world's largest bazaar or something. It is the largest bazaar. Uh, most visited, you know, attraction in the world. And Neil, when they started it, apparently they were no one there was allowed to compete. No one there was allowed to uh, argue because they wanted people to come. Of course, today it is very touristic, but you can still find some really nice things in there. Just be prepared to bargain a lot. And if you want to go to another market and really buy things, then go to the spice market, which is not far away. But just the arches of the Grand Bazaar, just walking through it, those colorful lamps, you're like in, you know, Aladdin's cave or something. It's really stunning. So so at least three nights because the clothes in Turkey, the shoes in Turkey, lamps, coffee, there are just too many things. So take an empty bag with you. Probably a destination, probably a destination for everyone, a yes. foodie a cultural enthusiast, Everything. a historical or Luxury, historic, yeah, history enthusiast. Leisure. Everything, everything right? Everything. everything. I guess let's let's end it on that, guys. That was the largest city in Turkey. 
the 15th largest city in the world as per my research a city that has 450 kilometers of coastline serves as the only passage between the black sea and the mediterranean sea and a city that is politically culturally historically significant to the entire world that was istanbul thank you so much for listening to travel explore celebrate life guys this is neel and sunila both of us signing off from vina world take care and we'll see you next week bye bye